And so good morning planet Earth. Here we are again on the bottom of the ocean. What is down there? Until you go down and explore, you just don't know. It's just like science fiction, but it's the reality. Single greatest impediment to studying the deep ocean is that it's not as transparent as air. I can look up with my own eyes and see the surface of the moon a quarter of a million miles away, but I can't even see half a mile into the ocean. A lot of people seem to view the deep sea as sort of out of sight, out of mind. But the, the deep ocean affects everything else on the planet. Most of the carbon on Earth is in the deep ocean, and that carbon can stay there for a very long time if the deep sea ecosystem is functioning properly. We used to think that the deep sea would be like a desert, that we wouldn't find much life here. After all, we are so deep underwater that there is no light from the sun. There is no photosynthesis. But as we began exploring the depths of the ocean, we learned that there is plenty of life, animal life. Where there's water, there's life. The deeper we go, the weirder it gets. Today, we saw something that we certainly have never seen before. It looked like he was basically collecting bacteria off what appeared to be a smaller female with eggs and was eating that bacteria. So he was literally grooming this smaller shell, just in the same way that you would see chimpanzees, for instance, picking bugs off of the hair of a mate or group members. Incredible to see that same type of behavior in crabs. Crazy hydrothermal rock full of noxious chemicals, arsenic and selenium, and it's potentially radioactive, and yet it is teeming with life. All kinds of challenges living in an environment like this, yet life proliferates. When we find these unusual habitats, it gives us another end member in which to put other deep sea habitats into context, but also maybe give us some insights into the past, not only on Earth, but possibly we can think about other planetary worlds, watery worlds. It's one of the most magnificent things that I've ever seen in the natural world. It's a spiritual experience. It's not just a scientific experience. It changes you. It's one of those last places where it's a safe haven for fish uh, since it's closed. And not only that, but dumbo octopuses and six-gill sharks and lots of corals that are probably like a thousand years old and would want to keep it that way and have it stay that way. Now we know they're here, we have to think about and worry about what's going to happen to them in the future. Mining has a potential to destroy a lot of these corals because uh, the future of mining is looking at these hard substrates, uh, which is where the corals grow. Just because you can't see it or eat it doesn't mean it's not an important part of our planet. The deep sea is something that needs to be taken care of and managed very carefully in the coming years. The deep oceans is kind of like the engine of climate. Slowly moving, but actually ultimately controls the destiny of our planet almost. Because of course in the ocean nothing happens in isolation. Everything is connected both horizontally and vertically. So now having this extra layer of knowledge is going to be incredibly useful for any future management. If the deep sea is all one big unit, then you know you could put a few protected areas wherever it was convenient and that would take care of it. But if the deep sea is in fact divided up, into a bunch of biogeographic units, then it's important to have protected areas in each one. By communicating the beauty and majesty of these systems, their importance to the natural world, 
to global biochemical cycles on this earth, we're making people fall in love with the ocean. Everything in the world that's alive is basically forms a tapestry that ultimately holds us. And I think it's important to think about that because every time you lose something, you lose a thread out of the tapestry that ultimately supports us humans.